Well, good evening, friends. So glad you're here. It's great to see everybody in worship tonight. And I'm looking for my bulletin. Let's see. Let's find that. And no, I am not Pastor Myron Rhodes, but it's good to be with you tonight. Let me go back and give you some information as to how I arrived here this evening. It so happens that I was asked if I could cover the music for tonight because Freddie wasn't going to be able to be here. I said, sure, a couple of weeks ago, no problem. Then all of a sudden, Annette's mom got very sick and started to just go down, down, down. And uh, she, you probably all know she passed away, so Myron went up to do the service. So he called me, he said, was there any way you can preach? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you want me to get somebody else to do the music? I said, I'll be a one-man band, it's okay. <laughs> so I'm relying on you to give me a lot of blowback here, okay? So if I kind of disappear during the music, that's beautiful. That'll be perfect. So just tonight for Myron and Annette. This, these are hard days for them, and especially for Annette. She had a special relationship with her mom, and we had an opportunity to talk with her before she got away, and, and, um, and it's, it's just a painful time. You know if you've ever been through that what that's like, and it's been painful for her too. So be praying for them if you would. Also to let you know things you don't know. What it takes to set up this room for a service is far more than you could ever imagine. And your pastor comes down early every Saturday to get up. And so I came, I met Fred early. I left my house at 3.30 because I came down Monday night, spent time with Myron, learning about all this stuff. What has to be set up and plugged in here and there. And let me tell you, it went perfectly today. Right, Fred? No, it did not. <laughs> We're looking for things that we could not find, and he wrote out a book, and it's perfect. It's beautiful. He's got it laid out piece for piece. Well, no wonder the board's not coming on. It's not plugged in. But where's the cord? I don't know, but luckily Fred found it, so we managed to kind of piece things together. So I say all of that to say you got a bunch of rookies trying to get this thing established for tonight. It may go magnificently. It may not. So grace would be wonderful if you would uh, have that in your hip pocket and just say, hey, we're just glad to be here. Let me bring you some announcements. Or an announcement. Anybody go over here by the drink station a little bit ago? Anybody see the sign that's taped up on the wall there? We needed to write on it. Lori Scarborough did some great penmanship to do it in a bold sharpie so you could see it from 100 miles away. The request on there is we need more snacks for our time. So, hey, there's a sign sheet at the base of that that you could actually put your name on and say, I'll bring some things, and I'll tell you what you do. Just bring something you like. If you like it, somebody else is going to like it too. So we would just like to keep the flow of stuff coming in so that it things that we all participate in to make that a reality. So thank you for your help with that. Um, what else do we need to bring before the body tonight? Council meetings coming up second uh, Thursday of each month, so just know that's coming. And prayer meeting on Tuesday night, is that this Tuesday? Yes. The last Tuesday of each month, yes it is, at the, in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. So we'd love to see you at those events. Just know there's a lot of There's some ideas that are floating around out there that are um, in the works for some future stuff. And it's going to be exciting to see what God does in our midst. Join me as we begin our time of worship for a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy that comes to us in so many different ways. And we pray, O oh God, that you would bless this congregation, each and every person that is here, that you would give us, O oh God, a blessing more than our hearts could ever hold, that we might, in fact, be witnesses to your awesome glory, we pray, through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen.
I invite you to stand as we our affirmation of faith together. So I ask you this, this question. Church, what is it you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you be seated? Good evening. How's everybody? So for tonight, our first reading will be from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 4 to 13. Israel forsakes God. Now, Jeremiah was a major prophet and the author of the book of Jeremiah, probably written sometime around 626 B.C. Jeremiah was only about 17 years old when God called him to be a prophet to Israel and the nations to accuse Israel and warn them of the consequences of their sin and God's coming judgment. Jeremiah would face intense pressure when he delivered unwelcome messages to Israel, but God gave him the resilience he needed and his words would stand strong because of God's presence and his rescuing power. In between his messages of disaster and judgment, Jeremiah also delivered a message of hope for Israel's future. And now for the reading, chapter 2, verses 4 to 13. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness? through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and you defiled my land and my inheritance detestable. The priest did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyrus and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all but my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And that ends the first reading of the word of God for the people of God. So for our second reading, I'll be reading from chapter 13 of Hebrews, verses 1 to 8 and 15 and 16, concluding exhortations. No one knows for sure who wrote Hebrews or just when. Most scholars do believe it was written to the new Jewish believers to address those who were questioning, maybe second-guessing their conversion to Christianity. It was meant to address their doubts and to tell them not to go back on the steps they had taken. The book of Hebrews establishes the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ over all, and that his sacrifice was enough to remove our sin, and that Christ is all we need to come to God today. And now for the reading, verses 1 to 8 and 15 and 16 of chapter 13. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. 
For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And that ends the second reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, we thank you for these gifts, these tithes, and these offerings. And we pray, O oh God, that they would build up your church in this place, that we might become disciples fully devoted to you, O oh God, who make disciples for the transformation of the world. Come and use us, O oh God, in these gifts, that your kingdom might reign in this place, we pray through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen and amen. Would you be seated? Anybody know what tonight's theme is? Heart. How do you know that? You did the bulletin, right? <laughs> and thank you. I was looking. Here is trying to connect to the, and that's what about sometimes. So I apologize for that. Um, well, hopefully it'll stay. I'll try to find the right spot and stay there. Okay, and so humble humility, things of that nature, and so I found this story and I went, wow, this speaks to my heart. I hope it does yours too. And this is what the person writes. I was parked in front of the mall, wiping off my car. I had just come and was waiting for my wife to come out of work. Coming my way from across the parking lot was what society would call a bum. From the looks of him, he had no car, no home, no clean clothes, and no money. There are times when you feel generous but there are also times when you feel like you just don't want to be bothered. This was one of those, I don't want to be bothered moments. I hope he doesn't ask me for money, I thought. He didn't. He just came and sat on the curb in front of the bus stop, but didn't look like he had enough money to even ride the bus. Finally, after a few moments, he spoke. That's a very pretty car, he said. He was ragged, but had an air of dignity about him. Thanks, I said, and continued working on my car. He sat quietly while I continued, and the expected plea for money never came. As the silence between us widened, something told me to ask him the question. Do you need any help, I asked. I expected nothing but an outstretched hand. 
But he spoke three words that shook me. Don't we all, he said. I was feeling high and mighty, successful and important, above a bum on the street until those three words hit me like a shotgun blast. Don't we all? I need help. Maybe not for bus fare or a place to sleep, but I needed help. I reached into my wallet and gave him not only enough money for the bus, but enough for a warm meal and shelter for the day. Those three little words still ring true. No matter how much you have, no matter how much you've accomplished, you need help too. No matter how little you have, no matter how loaded you are with problems, even without money or a place to sleep, you can help. Even if it's just a compliment, you can give that. You never know when you may see someone who appears to have it all, yet they are waiting for you to give them something they don't have. A different perspective on life, a glimpse of something beautiful, a respite from daily chaos that only you can see. Was this man a homeless stranger wandering the streets or something more than that? Certainly, he knew this truth. Don't we all need help? And I thought, wow. How many times have we encountered highways and byways and we think, do I even make eye contact? We kind of, or we think they're in another class than we are somewhere. Well, Jesus talks about this in Scripture. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn gospel. We'll start reading in the 14th ch- You know what? I'm going to go to this mic. Uh, Doug, can you switch me off here? Thank you very much. So we're going to start reading the 14th chapter, the first verse, then we're going to jump down to verse 7. And it says this. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who has invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, Move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the, at the resurrection of the righteous. And may God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of this, his holy word. And did you notice what's going on there? Jesus has a different economy in life than what we're used to. Instead of this idea that we're self-made, it's not that way at all. He says, if you want to be first, get in the back of the line. That's how you do it. If you want to be great, be small. It's the exact opposite of how we see this dog-eat-dog world that is radically different. Fight for all you can get, be who you can be, step on whoever you have to step on to get to where you want to be. And you can have it all. Really? No. It doesn't work that way. And Jesus is telling us the exact opposite. So we we look at his words and we go, wow, because we see things different than that in our lives. It's not exactly that way. And sometimes when we start feeling really good about the things we've done, something kind of sets into our lives. Like vanity, maybe just a little. You remember Carly Simon's song from years ago, You're So Vain? Wow, you're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. You're so vain, I bet you think this song is about you. Don't you? Don't you? 
And supposedly that was written for Warren Beatty. She had been dating him and he dumped her. So she wrote that song about him. And there's a word out there that supposedly he wrote her a letter saying, thank you for writing a song about me. Really? That, that's the extent of vanity, if there ever was any. Thanking her for writing a song about being vain and it's about me. Yeah, hey, sweet. Wow, don't know if that's true, but that's the word that's out on the street. And we look at life and what happens when we get into vanity, right? Pride starts welling up in us and what, what do we say about pride? What comes after pride? The fall, that's exactly right. And nothing happens no more of a better example than the devil himself. Right, we see what he was doing when he thought he could be equal to God himself. He decided, well, huh, I'll go out on my own. And he took a third of the angels with him, thinking he could become something far more. In fact, if you look in the book of Isaiah, you'll read some of this account. This is Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, mighty though you were against the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to the heaven and rule the angels. I will take the highest throne. I will preside on the mount of assembly far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. But instead, you will be brought down to the pit of hell, down to its lowest depths. And it wasn't just Lucifer convincing himself and the other third of the angels. But remember that time in the Garden of Eden? There he, he the serpent's body goes up to Eve and he says, hey, let me ask you something. See that apple in the tree? Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Well, you ought to taste it. It even tastes better than it looks. Oh, the Lord told us not to eat of this tree. He didn't really tell you you would die, did he? He didn't say that. Are you sure? He puts questions in her mind. So, of course, we know the end of the story. She partakes. She gets her husband, Adam, says, come on, join this. This is great stuff. And their own vanity, their own pride became their downfall. And then guess what? We all have issue because of the original sin that entered into the world. Now it's part of the DNA of every person who's born. And so we have that built into us, but Jesus is saying, no, take a different place. Have some humility about you. Wouldn't it be nice if people said, how do you get humility? Have you ever asked that question? Go ahead and ask me. How do you get humility? I am so glad you asked. Because we're looking at this tonight, right? Jesus gives the parable of the, of the wedding feast. And he goes, no, don't pick the place of honor. Go somewhere else. And hopefully we'll move you back up. This idea of humility, it's not about me. It's not about me. But sometimes we make things about us. So how do we get into a life of humility? Well, I'm glad you asked. Three things I want to bring to you tonight. The first is, see yourself the way God sees you. A lot of times we think of humility as, I need to put myself down, right? That I need to count for nothing. Don't matter. Or I'm a, a, door, a doormat that people just walk over. No, that's not the case. You matter. Everybody matters. So it's not that you know, humility that says, oh, I don't count for anything. No, it isn't. But we look at Scripture to see who we are in God's economy. And when we do, we find out first, we are sinners. You and I, we are all sinners. In fact, Scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not one does any good. Not one. Now, do we do good things from time to time? Yes, we do. But in, in comparison to God, we're not good. In fact, at one point, somebody went up to Jesus and said, oh, good teacher. And he goes, ho, oh, oh, ho, who are you calling good here? Even Jesus said, there is no one good but God. I think he's pretty good. He's perfect. I'm not. So we see this idea that we're all sinners, right? Paul talked about that. He spoke about this sinful life that we all, we all have, but we are also children of God. Don't miss that. So we have to live in between these two things. We're living in the tension of being a sinner on one side and being a child of God on the other. Does that work? 
Well, Paul wrote about that when he said this. He goes, why is it that I'm a wretched man? I don't do the things I should do, and the things I should do, I don't. And I'm thinking, thank you, Paul, for actually putting that down on paper. Because that's my story, too. Why is it that happens with us? Because there's something inside of us that's vain, that's wrong, that's less than humble, and we don't do the things God calls us to do. And it may be as simple as you see someone that God wants you to speak to, and you avoid it. Like the story we read in the very beginning. It may just be speaking a word to someone. You never know how that's going to affect someone else's life. So why is it that happens? But Paul goes on to say in the next chapter, we are co-heirs with Christ. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said we're sinful people and co-heirs with Christ. Yeah, because Jesus has done that for you and for me. Wow. So even though we're sinful, we better be moving in the direction of Jesus Christ. We're either moving forward or backwards in our spiritual life. We are not staying still. We're not just marking time. We're either moving forward or backwards. So where are we in this relationship? Children's story is told about the donkey who carried Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And it was a young donkey. And so they hoisted Jesus up on his back, and in they walked, and the donkey goes, this is incredible. Look at this. People are lining the street. They're cheering for us. They're shouting Hosanna. They're singing songs. They're waving branches. They're even laying them on the ground. They're putting their cloaks there. And boy, when I walk on that, my hooves feel a lot softer. This is great. He loved the attention. He loved the atmosphere. It was fabulous. So like a week later, he wanted to experience it again. Goes back into the city. Where are the crowds? Where are all the people? Where are the palm branches and the, the songs that were being sung? And where are the people happy to see me? They're not there. In fact, they're shooing me away. And when I don't leave, they start throwing rocks at me. And he didn't understand what that was all about. So instead, he went back home and talked to his mom. That's what we do as little kids, right? We go talk to mom. And he explained what had happened, or what he experienced. And his mom said, well, don't you understand? You had Jesus with you the first time. <laughs> You're nothing without Jesus. And that's your story, and that's my story. And it doesn't mean that you're a nobody, okay? But we find our identity in Jesus Christ. Know who you are. When I look at my life, I know what my gifts and graces are. They are not things that I acquired on my own. They are things that God blessed me with. Now, can we sharpen those a little bit through, it's kind of like I'm going to do some spiritual muscle here. Yes, you can sharpen the gifts that God has given to you. But you didn't do anything to acquire them. God gave them to you. So let's remember, we're not anything without Jesus. So that's the first thing we need to know. When it comes to humility, know who you are in God's eyes. Also, it's how we treat other people, right? How is it with other folks that we're with? Jesus said, let others take the place of honor, not ourselves. My wife will tell you, whenever there's a church meal, whether it's here or wherever we've been throughout our lives, when we're doing that and there's the long table laid out of food, she says to me, you're going to go last, aren't you? And I say, yeah, yes, I am. And doesn't that make me sound humble, right? The only thing about humility is when you think you've got it, you just lost it, right? But yeah, that makes me look real good. Let me tell you what's really going on there. Yes, I like other people to go first. And I want to be sure we're not going to run out of food. So everybody else, you go. If I have to catch a meal later, no problem. But maybe the real reality is, at the end, I can eat all I want because everybody's already gone, right? So maybe some ulterior motives that aren't so humble there, right? But this idea that we let others go first, that we serve other people. It's not about serving us. And Paul said that to the church. He said, we can tell who you are by who you serve. And it's about serving other people. And so when we look at that, we go, wow. 
really well with that, unbelievably well. When I see all the places where Grace Wesleyan Church is in service to the community, well done. Well done, church. Keep it up. Don't slow down. Keep the pedal to the metal because you're making a difference for this community. And God is pleased when he sees that. But sometimes when we start looking inward to self, we might feel like Mac Davis when he wrote the song, It's Hard to Be Humble. You remember that song too, probably, right? Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't even look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Not. <laughs> because it's not about me. It's about how I treat other people. And yet we see that in the life of Jesus Christ, more than anyone, a supreme example. You remember when he was with the disciples in the upper room on that Thursday night, and he took a bowl of water and a towel that was wrapped around his waist, and he started to wash the disciples' feet one by one. Now you think about washing of feet in his day. Who did that in the house? The servants. It was their job to wash the feet of the guest who came in. And here's Jesus taking the role of a servant, and they're going, what are you doing? And he said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. That's my whole point. That's why I'm here. And I'm showing you an example of what it's all about. And he started going around washing the feet one by one. He got to Peter, and Peter objected. Hey, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, then you won't have any part of me. He said, then in that case, wash my whole body. And what did Jesus say? You don't need to do that. You've already had a bath today. The rest of your body is clean. It's just your feet that have been walking the dusty street to be cleaned off. If I don't do this, you will have no part of me. Okay, then. Wash my feet. And he said that and let them know, I have laid before you an example. You go and you do likewise. Same thing for you. Go and make others more important than you in your life. So what, what do we see about humility? Know who you are in God's eyes. How you treat other people is vitally important. But number three, sometimes we grow through difficult times. Paul talked about having a thorn in the flesh. You might remember that. And it was agonizing to him. And he, he received that in his mind because God said to him, you know what the problem is? I don't want you to be conceited, so I'm going to put a thorn in your side. And so he prayed three times that it would be taken. The answer to him was, my grace is sufficient for you. It's basically like he's saying, deal with it, Paul. It's there. Just deal with it and move on. But it's there for a reason, to keep you humble so that you don't get out of line or think that you've done something of your own accord that's really good because I'm the one who's good, and I'm passing things on to you. Boy, you ever been knocked down from time to time when you're feeling pretty big about yourself, and all of a sudden something happens, and they kick the rug out from underneath you, and you're going, wow, that was a hard landing, but I needed that. Oh, yeah, come back with me 50 years ago when I was in junior college, and I was starting to major in music, and boy, you could see the chip on my shoulder when I walked in that music theory class for the first day. I went up right to the front, sat down in front of the professor, and I'm ready. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to show these people what music's all about. After all, I have uh, played the clarinet for six years in the junior high and high school band. Man, and I've played the guitar for about five years, and I, I sang in choirs. I can read music. These people are in for a lesson. I'm glad I could be here to give it to you, right? And so I just sit down. I'm feeling really good about myself. And the professor, we'll call her Mrs. Johnson because that was her name. And so she, uh, she says to us right out of the chute, she goes, okay, everybody, take out your manuscript paper. Manuscript paper are the five lines that you write musical notes on. And you have a whole page of that. And I said, oh, manuscript paper. I didn't have any, so I looked at the guy to my right. I said, hey, can I borrow a sheet of manuscript paper? He goes, yeah. He said, good. All right, let's move on. She said, now, take out a pencil. We never use a pen in this class, only pencils. Hey, can I borrow a pencil? Yeah, okay. 
Now I'm 0 for 2. So then she says, now on, on the staff, write a treble clef. Draw a treble clef on there. I'm going, treble clef, treble clef. Okay. Uh, the clarinet plays on the treble clef. It looks kind of like an S. I kind of drew an S on that thing. And then she drew the real thing. And I went, well, that was pretty close. It kinda, and I was going to draw it out for you here, but I don't have a board to do that. And so I, uh, I sort of got that one, but not really. And then she said, now draw a bass clef. And I'm going, a bass clef? I sing on the bass clef, but I've never drawn it. What does it look like? And I couldn't think. And I drew something, some kind of a stick thing that looked like I fell asleep while I was drawing something, and it just kind of put a line on the paper. And then she drew the real thing. Well, let me tell you, that was my best day of music theory. It was all downhill from there, if you can imagine. And yes, at the end of the semester, I was pulling up the flag. I got a big F in that class. Nice job. So I retook it, and I got a C the next time around. But let me tell you, I learned some real humility in that process. But sometimes God allows us to, to learn a lesson here and there because we may be getting a little too big for our britches, or we think we've arrived in some way, shape, or form. And God brings a little humility in our direction. Now, that's probably not your story, but it certainly is mine. And I try to walk in God's ways and try to just say thank you if a compliment comes my way. But just to know that there's a way to be more humble, to follow the ways of God. And part of that is just this prescription. that Know who you are in God's eyes. Watch how you treat other people. That's a reflection of our humility. And then know there may be some trials coming your way to help keep you in that vein. The story is told about a man who was walking down the street in New York City, and he wasn't paying attention. He was probably on his phone while he's walking down the street. He fell into a, a deep hole, and it was a hole that had very slick sides to it, so he couldn't climb out, but he tried his best. It wasn't happening. And he finally yelled up. He saw somebody going by. Happened to be a doctor. He said, excuse me, can you, can you help me get out of this hole? The doctor pulled a prescription pad out of his pocket, wrote him a prescription, dropped it in the hole, went on his way. Well, that was no help. So next thing you know, a priest comes by. Hey, can you help me out of this hole? Well, he says, I got a piece of paper here. Wrote him a prayer, dropped it in the hole, went on his way. Again, no help. Then his friend goes by. Hey, Joe, Joe, can you help me? I'm down in the hole. Joe goes, sure. He jumps right down in the hole with him. And he goes, what did you do that for? Now we're both stuck down here. He goes, it's OK. I've been down here before. I know the way out. <laughs> I know the way out. And I know the way out of a life that's not in God's economy. He calls us all to be humble, to follow him. And if you've got your, uh, your bulletin, let me invite you to open to the inside. There is a prayer written there that is absolutely amazing. And it's on the, uh, on the outside. It's called A Prayer for Humility. And I just want to conclude the message with this prayer. Father, today we ask for your help to walk humbly with our brothers and sisters. It is all too easy for us to fall prey to our flesh and walk in arrogance, but pride causes division, and we desire peace. Lord, help us to humble ourselves in order that we do not let the lies of the enemy overtake us. Rather, help us to count ourselves as equals with one another. It is then that we will stop attempting to be better than others, and we can love their hearts for the unique person you made them to be. Help us to value one another in this humble spirit so that we may live life to the fullest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, did you miss me last week? If you didn't, I miss you. And so I'm glad to be back this week. You know, once again, we are having to put uh, on our prayer list those who are hurting and grieving. Uh, Pastor Larry mentioned 
that Annette uh, lost her mother who was 80, I mean, 98 years old. And so we know that Pastor Myron is there with her. The rest of the family were there as well. So we just need to keep uh, the Rhodes family in our prayer as we move along. <clears throat> Patrick McCarthy also mentioned that a neighbor, a friend of theirs, passed away this week. And so we need to keep them in our prayer. I see Gail Johnson here tonight. <laughs> And Gail had to put down her best friend, her loving, you know, dog, Gator. And you know, people, for those who live alone, who have a, a pet of some type, that's their best friend. That's so somebody who keeps them company. And to them, that loss is just as severe as it would have been if it was then a child or other kinds of loved ones. So we need to just keep Gail in our prayers. <clears throat> uh, Barbara Tenneman is home and she's successfully uh, recuperating from uh, the surgery where the doctor removed all the cancer. And thank goodness, I think she will have to undergo chemotherapy. And so we need to keep her in a prayer. We have Kelly with us here today. Uh, Kelly is Joyce's daughter. Uh, Kelly is moving to North Carolina. She's going to be buying a condo. And so we need to keep Kelly in a prayer in terms of hopefully everything goes well and that she will make all the right decisions in her life as she moves forward and uh, moved to North Carolina. Kathy Porter is here. And Kathy apparently had, uh, is on her recovery from COVID. And so we got to continue to pray for her recovery. We have a number of people who are traveling. And so we have to provide an usher traveling mercies. We've got the Burtons who are in the, in the uh, Canadian Rockies, you know, up around Banff and uh, places like that. So there, uh, we need traveling mercies for them. And obviously, Pastor Myron, who's traveled to Arkansas to be with uh, his wife. Uh, Joyce's son is traveling or has traveled uh, to be home with his, with his mom. And so we uh, offer some traveling mercies there. Uh, Joelle, her sister Paulette, <coughs> you know, is experimenting or doing some new medication to treat her lupus, and we need to pray that that medication goes well. Am I right? Okay. okay. Uh, Laura Dusek has asked that we also pray for the brother of her hairdresser, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So when you look at the list, you know, we got a wide range of people who are in need of our prayer. And so let's go to a Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we offer and up to you the names of the individuals that we have mentioned aloud. For those who are experiencing grief, Father, we ask for your mercy, we ask for your blessing on them and give them the peace and the comfort they need as they uh, undergo this situation with their grief. Father, we also ask to bless those who may not have a human being that they lost, but they lost somebody that was dear to them and so we ask that you continue to provide comfort as they, they grieve. Continue to heal those who are suffering from all kinds of illness, including COVID, lupus, and other kinds of ailments. You are the great healer, the great physician. And Father, we know that you can heal 
those who are suffering from various kinds of ailments. Father, we also ask those who are traveling or those who are out there, and we ask that you keep them safe as they make their way home and let them be safe. There are those, Father, who are adventuring out into new territories, trying to make a way on their own, moving, buying condos, and doing all those things that says, hey, I'm on my own. But nevertheless, Father, we ask that you continue to be with them and provide them all the, the comfort and all the guidance they need to make the proper decisions. So Father, we lift all these things up to your precious name in Jesus, who says, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive this benediction, if you will. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his pardon, his purpose, and his power to walk humbly with him all of your days. In Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Go in God's peace.